What sets the healthy imagination apart is its ability to imagine things otherwise. So think about buying a fixer-upper home and not just seeing all of the, the damage, but seeing the improvements in your mind, seeing it otherwise. That's an, ex that's an example of the healthy imagination. That is what I think is largely absent on the American scene right now. Hello, and welcome to Thinking Out Loud. I'm your co-host, Nathan Rittenhouse. And I'm your co-host, Cameron McAllister. And today is election day. So it's also a day past or two past uh, daylight savings. My children have not adjusted yet, so it's great having kids running around the house an hour earlier in the morning. But uh, that's my problem, perhaps not yours. But Cameron, I thought it'd be good to talk about uh, election day. And we'll get into some of the, I want to talk about it as a statement of national hope. But before we do mm. that, just a friendly little reminder of the fact that Thinking Out Loud is a nonprofit. And just a little crash course here for everybody. Nonprofits are not supposed to be engaged in partisan political discourse or favoring candidates or anything like that. And it's actually one of the primary sources of irritation for non-Christians is to say that churches as tax exempt entities sometimes very much are involved in the political process and advocating for politicians um, or specific parties at least. And that is clearly a violation of the fine print, uh, or maybe not so fine print, of what it means to be a nonprofit. And so those of you who are part of institutions, organizations who are tax exempt, I think that's a fine thing to be reminded of as you go into this season, that your tax exempt status um, also means that you're stepping back from uh, being a political pundit or uh, channeling finances in a direction that influence the outcome of elections. So just a little reminder to ourselves there as Christians that if we want to play by the rules, we need to use the organizations that we build in a responsible way as well. So how's that for a little happy election day kickoff? You start us off on a very responsible note. <laughs> I think part of what comes to mind here, Nathan, as we talk about this, this, the, the area of politics it's just how grim everybody seems to feel, regardless of where they fall on the political spectrum. And I think I'm reminded of an observation you made a while ago that I thought was very shrewd. And it basically, you were saying, people are dreading the future. Mm -hmm. You can look back not too long ago, actually, and people were still not necessarily totally sunny-eyed and optimistic, but they, they had high hopes for the future. They were excited. As an, if you look at our national mood right now, that is not the case. I think when it comes to politics, be, people are basically just hoping that we can avoid the worst. If we can, if we can avoid the, the worst, then we'll have made some progress. But I mean, mm -hmm. that is that's a, a, a major shift in tone from well, let, let me, not so long ago. Yeah, let me try this analogy and tell me if you think this fits. So. Um, I often talk about the fact a year or two ago, our garage burned down, woodshed, chicken house, all that sort of excitement. And um, what was really, I mean, so it was a bad, bad deal. But what was weird for me is that all of my tools burned up. And so anytime that I had a problem in life, it was like, oh, just run out there and grab my tools and fix this. Well, suddenly I had a problem and had zero tools. And I wonder if that's like some of the, the switch in the national optimism of like, oh, yeah, things are tricky in the past, but we have the tools to put this back together. We have the tools to fix this. And now there's a sense in which we've reached a level of dysfunction, um, and particularly in our communication skills or maybe even collective vision, that we don't feel like we have the tools any longer to build or to respond to the challenges of the future. Now, I think we probably do, but I'm also just asking, do you think maybe that's some of where this is coming from of like, you know, we're not going to pull this off or get our act together. And we don't really have the resources that we once did in order to fix this. Is that analogous? I think so. I do think that's an apt picture. But also, like you said, we do probably have some of those tools. I think the hesitancy there is that we don't have any short term solutions. And again, we're speaking in kind mm -hmm. of broad and general terms here. But as Nathan, as you reminded us at the beginning of this podcast, we are bound and obligated to, to speak in broad terms here. Well, uh, but yeah, also so just so that we can see this is widely applicable. 
Yeah, but I also I I don't know. I think so. Yeah, I I don't think we wouldn't say anything because it's illegal necessarily, but also because it's part of the the um, way that we operate too at thinking out loud is that when we talk about current events and Christian hope, you've probably never heard us talk about hope in terms of like on the shoulders of a specific politician or political party. Our hope is a uh, much much deeper and broader and expansive and long term than that. So in some ways I don't feel hemmed in by any uh restrictions or you know the fine print of any legal document as much as yeah I just have a bigger bigger hope. So in some ways this uh yeah it's it's not a problem for me. Right. No. And we're not a partisan podcast as as most of you have have gathered over the years. But I would Here's here's one one observation I would like to I would like to bring in with regard to hope. So I think many people know instinctively we may have some some tools still at our disposal for helping to improve our political climate, our cultural climate, but I think people are also recognizing that some drastic changes would have to happen, some major self-sacrifice would have to happen, probably on the part of many politicians. Some people would have to fall on their swords, so to speak, give up their office, possibly. One major missing element in, I think, most most of our political arenas is self-sacrifice. The, the, the willingness to forfeit one's office, if, you know, to stand on firmly on one's convictions, what you see usually is somebody trying to consolidate their influence or their power or to hold on to their office. So that would require some people to to be forerunners to make room there. But the observation I want to bring in comes from William F. Lynch's book, Images of Hope. William F. Lynch was a Catholic intellectual and a priest. If any, If he's remembered at all, he's remembered for a little book he wrote called Christ and Apollo. But it may be Christ or Apollo. I'll do a little Googling here to, to solidify that. <laughs> but his book, his book Images of Hope is very helpful. And it's a very incisive book on hope. And it doesn't go in the directions that at least I anticipated when I read it. It ended up being, I was, it was sort of reading it because of, you know, for research purposes. And it ended up being a tremendously convicting book as I read it. He, he wrote this book based on his experiences working with people who were mentally ill and mm. people who were in basically a state of critical hopelessness. But one of, one of the features he draws attention to is the centrality of imagination when it comes to hope. And he's going to talk about the realistic imagination. So this is not the imagination of, say, you know, total exuberant creativity that's a wonderful thing that's not what he has in mind here so is he distinguishing he has in mind, fantasy and imagination well fantasy could yeah i mean yes he would fantasy i think fantasy is like would, otherworldly is, imagination is like what is theoretically yes. possible in the world in which we actually inhabit sure and obviously i mean imagination can give birth to all sorts of fantasies some of them really elaborate right lord of the rings some of them just mere escapism where you just want to get away from reality and you're you know you're fantasizing about being a rock star or something like that so yeah he's distinguishing from that what he's talking about when he talks about the realistic imagination is the ability to see things otherwise mm -hmm. and so he uses some very practical helpful examples so for instance, when you buy a new house, it's a fixer upper and it needs some work. My house is, was, is, was sort of an intermediate fixer upper when, when my wife and I bought it and we still have some regions of the house that have to be improved. But when we bought it, we didn't just see, we didn't see the house just as it was. We could see it otherwise. We had improvements in mind. We had carpets being ripped out and new floors being put in. And we had, you know, we, we had gardens where there was just sort of wild land and, you know, kudzu. I live in Georgia. So that's, that's, a, that's an exercise of the healthy imagination. That's seeing it otherwise. Hopelessness creeps in when the, when the realistic imagination stops functioning properly. And you can't see things other, other than otherwise. You, you simply, you either willfully won't or you're afraid to. That's, that's a species of despair. 
So it does seem to me, done with this long meandering example, it does seem to me that <laughs> as a nation, people on all sides of the of the political spectrum are having a hard time seeing things otherwise. And that's what stops us from using some of the tools that we do have at our disposal, limited though they may be, damaged though they may be. Everybody who I talk to who sees things as so grim sees them also as irreversible. The situation is so bad. We can't, we can't hope to improve anything. All we can hope to do is try to maybe maintain some semblance of stability and prevent worse things from happening. I think that's, if I, as I tried to spell out the implications of what you said about people being afraid of the future or dreading the future, I would say it's the ability, it's the inability to imagine things otherwise. That's a really helpful phrase, I think, in something that we could we could end the podcast right there. I'm like, yeah, yeah. However, two two responses to that, if you're feeling a bit of that yourself. One of those is just even from a totally secular perspective, America is pretty great. Um, <laughs> I mean, so when you're like, oh, this is compared to what? I think would be my my pushback question there a little bit to people who are feeling that way. So yeah, you can recognize there's some difficulties, but what other country do you want to be living in right now to be working through this? So let's just have a little bit of perspective there of, eh, yeah, things aren't what, and that's not like to say everything's fine. It's just to say that comparatively, I think we have to be careful how we complain because some of our complaints are pretty first world issue type stuff. Um, and I get it. People are going to say, well, we're headed toward, you know, okay, just take a breather and look at what we do have working right now and be thankful for that. There's, there's room for that to catch your breath on the despair train there. So um, that's going on. Secondly, is that not the goal of the church is to embody the imaginative other or the other possibility of saying, yeah, but this is how it could be. And so I don't know that most people are thinking about their church participation like that, or most people outside the church seeing that as a realistic alternative, because if we're too closely linked politically as a church, then it doesn't seem like an alternative. It seems like more of the same thing. Can you say something about how the church and that, um, you have to give me the exact phrase again there, realistic imagination. Seeing things otherwise. Of, seeing the things otherwise. Mm -hmm. Is the church a viable, is the church seen as a viable expression of seeing things otherwise in short here in north america i don't think it is right now not the public face of the church because if you're too i want to respond to what you said about embodying that because i think that's really important so if we're too involved with a particular political cause that's going to end up looking like, I mean, essentially we're going to look like, it's not just that we look like everybody else, but it comes across as the same form of despair. And now why would us, <laughs> why would an explicit poli political endorsement look like a form of despair? It would in our particular yeah, moment. I mean, I, I see that, but you got to go slow here because yes, most people are not thinking right. of it in those terms. Right. So it would in our particular moment, because what's happening is a lot of people have basically operated under the assumption that the only way to really make a difference and to really reverse harmful trends in our society is through legislation of some kind and getting the right people in office. Now, that may not be explicitly communicated, but you but actions can speak louder than words there. And so when crisis language is used very heavily surrounding elections, and fear-mongering has always been a part of politics because mm -hmm. using fear as a political tool is incredibly effective. It works really well. We are, I mean, of course, this is election day. You've seen some of the political ads. And you can always fear unite people huge... against something easier than for something. Correct. Yes. But... When you hear that crisis language being spoken by prominent Christians, 
you know, you must vote. Your, <laughs> I'm not going to name names here, but men, plenty of you will know who this is. Your faithfulness depends on your vote. Do you, I'll try to, I'll try to go slow here. I'll go at a glacial pace. I, and take this with a grain of salt. This is Cameron McAllister talking. This is not, I don't speak on behalf of all Christians. You can draw your own conclusions here. I do see that as a species of despair. Because what that effectively is communicating is, yes, the Lord is good and in control, but if we don't vote in a certain way, if we don't use the influence that we have at our disposal as citizens, if we don't act responsibly, we may not be able to avert the coming crisis. So in other words, it is on your shoulders after all. And I, I'm not denying, again, I'm not recommending quietism. I'm not recommending that we shirk our responsibilities, that we, that we don't be, that we're not active as citizens. But we're not, it's that kind of, that kind of crisis, that kind that sense that if we don't do this, all may be doomed in some sense is not accurate. So that's, yeah, I think that's right. Let me give you some words. So I was um, back at the University of Virginia on Friday and I was talking, it came up in the Q&A and I was talking about hypocrisy in the church. And I said, you know, when we look at people getting frustrated with Christianity in our current time, it's not so much about moral hypocrisy, I don't think. I mean, there is moral hypocrisy. Turn on the news and find your favorite scandal and like run repeat on it. Um, it's out there. But Christian theology has a well-developed way of handling moral hypocrisy. We believe in the concept of sin, repentance, forgiveness, restoration. That is part of the cycle of God working and sanctifying us um, in our lives. So that the, the the moral hypocrisy, yes, it's a problem. Not I'm not I'm not saying that it's okay. I'm just saying that it's conceivable how that happens. Where I think there are more people that are struggling is to see Christians having hope hypocrisy, not moral hypocrisy. Um, so yes, moral hypocrisy is bad, but hope hypocrisy is when you have a group of people who say, we trust God for the future of the church. We've read scripture. We see that the church prevails. It's a promise of Christ. We know where we're coming from. We know where we're going. We have a, a stability in our identity. We have a clear vision and a picture of what we're supposed to be doing and who we are. If that group suddenly starts to act like, but our hope is in this system over here and getting the right person elected, then you're being hypocritical with your hope. So you can have an interest in that other system, but you cannot, as a Christian, have hope in the political system in a way that makes the watching world think that your hope is more deeply embedded in your political roots than in your congregational and in the kingdom of God foundation and identity that you have. So you can uh, support a politician, but you cannot worship a politician and still be a Christian. And almost nobody would say, yeah, I do that. Well, but just think about the time and the energy that you spend being discipled by certain programs and parties and back channel of the internet, like just think about where you're investing your time, your energy and your finances even. What does that say about your vision of hope? And again, I'm saying you can be interested in that, those things and you can support those things, but you dare not give off the vibe that your hope for the future is in there. Because actually, if you look at what Jesus, so I was just uh, preaching in Virginia what's it, yeah, yesterday um, at a church and saying, look at it's interesting in John 13 when Jesus says, so he, he knew that the Father had entrusted all power to him. He knew where he was from and he knew where he was going. And you're like, that's awesome. He has all power and total stability in his identity. Now he's ready to run the world. Except for in John 13, knowing those things, he gets up, takes a towel, wraps it around his waist and kneels down and washes his disciples' feet. And so he uses power and identity stability in order to serve, not rule. I mean, it's just kind of a very counterintuitive, and I don't know what that looks like being played out in everybody's lives who's listening to this individually, but we have to remember like that is the fundamental paradigm of our posture toward power, identity, and human action. And we got to operate in a way that the wires don't get crossed there on what it is that we're trying to do as a church. 
no, I think hope hypocrisy is something that we'll come back to. That's a very helpful way to phrase it. But I want to come back to something that you said earlier as well. So the second point that you made, the first one you recommended that we gain some perspective as American citizens on the the riches that our con- country offers as well, especially in the in the political arena. But then you talked about how Christians are called to embody that that otherwise, that imagination of the otherwise. Not so not just talk about how things might be otherwise, but embody it. That's different. So actually live out that otherwise. And that's where a phrase like hope hypocrisy gains even more, I think, gravity, moral gravity. Because we are citizens of heaven now, and now we can draw on some of that strange scriptural vo- vocabulary to describe our place in, in the world right now, citizens of heaven now or resident aliens, and we live in a manner that is out of step with our cultural environment because it is shaped by Christ. And for I mean, to phrase the matter somewhat clumsily, the culture of Christ and his church. <laughs> and so you are living as an embodiment of that otherwise in the way that you treat others. And especially, by the way, and this is, here's here's a really convicting word for us Christians here in North America. I think one of the most, the great obstacles that we face right now, and this is not everybody, again, the, I'll, I'll, I'll add in the qualification that there are numerous faithful, wonderful churches around this country that don't make the news because they're just not doing anything interesting enough in the eyes of the world to make the news and make those headlines. But by and large, a lot of the stories that we have feature Christians viciously fighting with one another. And that is a source of serious grief for both Nathan and myself, because one of, I mean, really the central aspect of our Christian credibility, according to, to God's word is the love that we have for one another. And so, and that's, and I think that's one of the principal ways in which we show how things can be otherwise, because no matter how you dice it, this is a very contentious cultural moment in the United States. This is, this is, and this is also, by the way, cultural tension is seething world, you know, around the world as well. I mean, if you go to, to Europe, for instance, right now, Mm-hmm. Things are quite hectic also, but it's so, I mean, we know all of this. We don't just know stories about how difficult it is to disagree, to get along. We all know this because we experience it when we're with our families, when we're with our friends and many people, I was just talking to somebody the other day who he said, it's so sad, you know, two, two family members who were formerly best friends. The one, the one guy was the best man in the other guy's wedding they won't talk anymore at all. And it's it's just politics. And of course, it's never just politics. There are deeper underlying issues. But that, so that that that's that's I think part of what makes it so difficult for people to imagine things otherwise, because mm-hmm. of that deeply entrenched animosity that we and, and that hostility that a lot of a lot of people feel and that just seems to erupt way more I think way in, with with greater I don't know, speed than it used to. So in that kind of an environment, when Christians display not sentimental love, I always love Stanley Hauerwas's way of putting this. He said, <laughs> people should, no, he's, he's overstating the case here, but people should look at the church and they, and they might say, man, these people hate each other, but they stay together. So I think we can hope for a little bit more than that, but <laughs> his point I think is well taken let's let's stay together and show people that things can be otherwise through a Christ-like love. It will have to be a Christ-like love. If we truly want to love others as ourself, there is no other way to do that other than to first love God with all that you are. But I think, Nathan, I'd love to hear you comment on that, but my my thesis here is just, it's just a New Testament thesis, is that our principal way of showing how things are otherwise is Christ-like love. I like the way Cardinal Urs von Balthasar said it. With It's actually the title of one of his books. He, he said, in the end, love alone is credible. And I think he's right. Well, so, yeah, I think you're right there as well, except for most people are going to push back and say, well, yeah, Cameron, but that's not practical. 
Um, <laughs> like that's the, uh, the comeback on that. So let me flesh out maybe a way in which it is. Um, so you used a phrase earlier. You said a species of despair. I like that yeah. line. That would be a good title to something. Um, a species of despair. So how can you know if you are, so a little self-diagnosis here. So how do you know if you are hoping too deeply in the political system? Um, I would think that we can look on the news and see forms of extremism um, leading even to violence to try to continue certain ideas and stuff that you would say, okay, that person has crossed the line. Um, but as we, as we think about how do we know the degree of hope that we have or despair that we have in that, I think, I don't know, does anything pop into your mind there? Like, what's a good, I am getting around to answering your question, but yeah. I need to answer this one first. What What are some good, like, I'm overdoing this a bit as a Christian? Well, I think, I do think the word, I think despair is the litmus test. Because if you look at current events, if you look at the political landscape and you feel a real, a deep sense of sadness, if you feel a deep sense of fear and anxiety, I think all of that is fine. All of that makes sense. Fear and anxiety, by the way, are inevitable features of human life in a fallen world. You don't want to be completely controlled by them, but I think the notion that you could somehow be rid of them completely is not realistic either. So that's fine. But if you look at it and you, and you feel a sense of despair, as in it's all hopeless, it's all over, that would communicate an unhealthy relationship to that political environment because you, if, if it could bring despair to you, then you would be thinking that it, it alone could deliver you from whatever trouble you see looming on the horizon. And even the word practical. So I've learned to become very suspicious of the word practical because usually... I baited you in right there. I admit it. You did. You did. But usually the word practical is functioning as a kind of... It's a sort of euphemism for, yeah, okay, but what, what, what's meant by that is the world of dollars and cents, the, the concrete, non-spiritual world where things actually happen, where stuff actually gets done. And that, if, that's, if that's what's being meant, I, I think the tacit philosophy of most Americans is money talks and something walks. I won't, I'll let you fill that in in your own minds. But... That is a thoroughly unchristian sentiment because it essentially treats the spiritual world as either unreal or totally irrelevant or both. And I think a lot of Christians get sucked into that line of thinking through that, through, through that misleading word practical. So, and this is also why scripture, this is why Paul uses words like foolishness when he's describing the Christian comportment and the Christian showing forth of that otherwise, things being otherwise. It looks like foolishness to many people in the world because it seems to be out of touch with reality. But of course, the reality to which Christians are loyal is the truth that Christ in him, all things hold together no matter what's transpiring on the globe, then that all shall be well. And again, that doesn't, that's not a recipe for quietism. That doesn't mean we're uninvolved. It means we can be involved, but we're freed of that crippling despair, that sense of hopelessness, because our hope is in God, ultimately, not in human systems. And we know that human systems are, are, are there, and we want them to function well. Of course we do. And we can be sad when, when causes fail. We can be sad when leaders fail. We can be sad when we see broken political systems. We can be sad when we see all of this. But if we're in total despair about it, it means our hope is misplaced. That's the litmus test. Yeah, so there's the, uh, you know, the whole, I, I guess what we're, if I can try to come up with a, a visual picture of what we're trying to say here, it's like, I don't know, maybe you did it as a kid or it's just a joke of like standing in a wash tub and trying to pick yourself up, right? You can't lift something while you're standing on it. Um, and so if you're all in and we're going to lift things up, if you're totally inside the thing that you're trying to elevate, the physics of that just don't work. You can't pick yourself up by your bootstraps. So you might need to be outside of your boots if you want to pick your boots up. And so this is looping back around to your question of or I'm saying, but actually there is a very real 
thing here if we say that, look, our stability and our identity is outside of the partisan political system, that actually gives us a better platform to be involved and engaged and see it for what it really is and make the most meaningful changes within it. But you can't be inside it and change it. You have to have an outside perspective of it and then work on it from there. So I think for me, it's just a lot of like, we're joining the system that we're critiquing when we're saying that we have to vote in order for the church to continue. That is grabbing your bootstraps right there with you in them. Step outside of that for a minute. Even look historically. I can look historic. My my family was preaching and teaching and planting churches in this country for 88 years before the United States even existed. The church was here before our current system existed. If Jesus knows anything about the future, the church will continue to exist way after even the United States does. Any other country of the world, we're all in, you know. So in some ways, we have to just step outside of this, frame it in its relative importance. It is important, but in its relative importance. The nations make their plan, the Lord laughs. They're but a drop in the bucket. Zoom back out to that level. And so have an interest, do what you need to do on Tuesday, but make sure that it's motivated by your vision of what God is doing in the world in the way of Christ, that you have a proper perspective, that you're outside of the wash tub, as it were, that in order to lift the things around you, you need to have a different foundation for your stability and your identity. And that is one of the great gifts that the church can bring to the world, not just the stability and identity that can help us shape our uh, common discourse together, but also a real sense of hope and something outside of that. And we can be people who live our lives in a way that invite other people to see that. And we can be that imaginative other, helping people see things otherwise to say, yeah, things are a little bit wonky here, but here's a group of people who still have it all together. I wonder what the source of their hope is. And when people ask that question, now you've moved from partisan politics to Christian apologetics. And I think uh, the Lord is honored and we get to uh, grin and delight in seeing what he's doing in the world when we make that move. Thanks for sticking with us on this. You've been listening to Thinking Out Loud, a podcast where we think out loud about current events and Christian hope. Thanks for listening to Thinking Out Loud. If you'd like to learn more about what we do, book Nathan or Cameron, Or if you'd like to support us financially, whether through a one-time donation or on a monthly basis, you can do so on the donate page at www.toltogether.com. That's toltogether.com. And please consider leaving us a five-star rating and sharing this content with your friends. It really does help.